my name's Kate, Kate Ponting, and for the last seven years I've been um, the Countryside Learning Officer um, at Clinton Devon Estates. And um, I talk to people of all ages, so I don't just work with school groups, um, and I talk about how the countryside works, um, including sometimes those, those difficult decisions and, and, and things. Um, because obviously, um, from an estate's perspective, we're, talk we're talking about a, a very broad landscape, um, one that produces our, our food, meets our timber and energy, energy requirements, provides place, places for people to live and work, um, as well as places for, for recreation and wildlife, which obviously um, I'm going to focus on today. Um, in my role, it, it's a really varied role. I support my, my land-based colleagues um, with their engagement and education priorities and I listen to local people. Um, I answer questions where I can, and I bring their concerns back to the estate to make us a better business. Um, as Mary suggested, I, you know, I work with schools and colleges and partner organizations, um, and I even occasionally get out to do some practical work. Um, this is a, 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 an area I was working very recently um, as I get to lead a team of volunteers once a week. My background, as uh, I know some of you know, um, is in teaching. Um, so I left teaching about um, in 2015 um, and I swapped the farm, that swapped the classroom for the farms and the woods and the rivers and obviously the East Devon Pebblebed Heaths. Um, they were granted National Nature Reserve status in 2020, 2020 um, and this honour really reflects Clinton's estate's values. Um, which are based on responsible stewardship and, and consistently doing the right thing, um, what we believe is the right thing for tomorrow's generations. So very few rural estates are trusted by Natural England um, with the expertise to look after a national nature reserve. I think there's, there's, there's one other in um, North Norfolk at the Holcombe Estate. Um, so it's a great honour to look after a national nature reserve of this calibre. Um, we work with other partners, so the Devon Wildlife Trust is one of them, the RSPB is the other, um, to offer an outstanding outcome for this, for nature and also for the people um, who, who come to visit as well. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about, about the heaths. Um, I know lots of you know it very well, maybe some of you know it less well, but I'm really going to champion the pebble beds, heathland generally, um, and kind of start by ask, answering the questions about, you know, where it is, what it is, why it's here, why it's so important, who manages it and how. Um, and then after that background, I'll consider some of the challenges and, and some new opportunities for the future. Um, and I'll take some questions at the end. So start with, with the where. Um, on, the, on the right hand side, there's an aerial image of of East Devon, uh, which clearly shows the heath, like a, like a spine sort of running down through uh, east of the, the X Valley. So you can see Exmouth at the very bottom uh, and Budley Solterton on, on the coast there. Um, but much of the water, but drains obviously into the Otter Valley in, 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 in the east. The heaths are about nine kilometers from top to bottom and um, they stretch about not uh, about three kilometers at the widest point. So the heathland covers a total of 1,160 hectares, making it the largest block of lowland heath in Devon. Um, the New Forest is probably the most well-known area of heathland in the UK, um, but it is a familiar habitat across southern and eastern England, um, as well as areas of northern Europe. You will all know that Devon has upland moors, of course, um, and some heathland is very similar in habitat to moorland. Um, the difference being, the main difference, um, without getting into too many details, uh, is that lowland heath is under a thousand metres. The Pebblebed Heath covers um, a series of adjoining or contiguous commons uh, with historic rights attached to the properties in, in local villages. So, so the commons take their name names from those villages, Colleton Rally, Bicton, Lipston, um, Aylesbeer, and so on. 80% of the pebble beds are owned by Clinton Devon Estates and managed by um, the estate's conservation charity, the East Devon Pebblebed Heath Conservation Trust. 
It's been open access since nine, the 1930s um, and then brought under the Crow Act of 2000, so the Countryside Right-of-Way Act, um, with additional rights granted to cyclists and to horse riders, which is not typical of, of other heathlands. Um, so, so obviously a big block and um, extending that rights to local people. Um, the remaining areas um, are leased or owned um, by the RSPB, by Devon Wildlife Trust and other private individuals. The heaths fall within um, the East Devon area of outstanding natural beauty um, and they're crossed by a, a long section of the East Devon Way. Much of the heaths are, are within a sort of I could have drawn lots of different maps, shown lots of different maps. This is actually just fairly the simplest one I could find. Um, the heaths have lots of different designations. So the heaths are a, a lot of the heaths is a triple SI, uh, a site of special scientific interest, a special area of conservation or a special protection area. And that relates to different bits of legislation in European and UK law. Um, much is also registered common land. Um, but as the boundaries differ, and it's it's a bit difficult to kind of say which bits are in, which bits are out. Um, so one of the great benefits of gaining national nature reserve status is that we can talk about the area collectively, um, sort of not worrying about who owns or manages it or which bits are in and which bits are out for the very first time. And also to include Mutters Moor, which is the funny sort of A-shaped piece, um, just sort of hanging there on its own, which is obviously over towards um, Sidmouth. So it's a little outlier on the east of the Otter. Um, it's got different geology um, and it wasn't designated um, to the same level as the others, but it is a county wildlife site. But now it's it's part of the Pebble Bed Heath National Nature Reserve with all of these other areas. Um, naming the heaths has always been an interesting one. Um, I've, I've lived in this area for 10 years. Um, and so the East Devon Pebble Bed Heath wasn't the name I, I first came to, to know it as. Um, but it is a bit of, and it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, even before you add National Nature Reserve or Conservation Trust on the end of it. So Woodbury Common is, is a very familiar term. That's certainly what the Marines call it because it's part of their training area. It's on the local signs. If you leave Exmouth, that's the one that you'll see on, on, the, on the road signs. So whether you call it Woodbury Common, whether you call it the Heaths, the Commons, or the East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths, um, they are all interchangeable. Uh, and when I talk about Heath, I will be talking about that sort of sp specifically about management or research i predominantly be relating it to the key portion managed by the our in-house conservation team, but I will use all of these terms interchangeably. So, so just just go go with that. Um, that that just seems to be the best way to go. Um, whichever one seems right, I, I will use, uh, and not get too worried about it having its official time uh, official title. So, a little bit about. Um, lowland heath or specifically for those of you I know who, who are out there who are real experts in this um, European dry heath um, or Atlantic wet heath so these are the two main habitat types on the heaths. Heathland soil is is really poor acidic free draining and sandy and our heaths are, are extra special so that mouthful of a name that I mentioned in the last slide um, really reminds us that the heaths are overlaying this deep bed of Triassic pebbles dating from uh, 240 million years ago. Um, I like to think that whoever named um, the stone chat must have had our pebbles in mind. Um, it certainly helps me remind um, groups that I'm out with that how, to, how to remember that, that bird's name. Lowland heath is, is rare, it's undervalued um, and it's threatened. Much of it has been lost in the last uh, 150 years. About 85% of Heathland has been lost. Um, what remains is very fragmented, often unmanaged um, and under pressure. Um, losses occur obviously because of development and urban expansion through soil improvement for um, to bring the land into better agricultural production and on wet sites or steep sites, often forestry. 
in global terms, heathland is far rarer than rainforest. That's that's a term that we often spin out, but it's true. It's true. Um, and being very rare, it's important. But here in Devon, particularly East Devon, um, the picture of heathland is obviously much more assured. We've got this big block, um, and it's 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 very very secure. And as forestry plantations on the heathland margins have reached maturity, some have returned to heathland. Uh, so for instance, Dolich Plantation, um, which is quite near Bystock Reserve, um, was returned to heathland after it was felled in uh, 1997, um, which is great for night jars, um, but the rich um, conifer seed bank is going to mean um, a lot of management for many years to come. Then we've got Black Hill, which um, is the photo at the bottom. Uh, sand and gravel quarry, which operated between uh, 1930 and 2011. Extraction then stopped, but aggregate industries continued to process material on the site until 2016. And the whole site is now at different stages of a 10 year aftercare period led by aggregate industries, which was part of the planning requirements. So about half the site is nearing the end of its aftercare and due to come back very soon to the estate. Um, and by 2026, the total area will see an additional 63 hectares becoming the day to day responsibility of the Conservation Trust. Uh, on this site, key species are doing really well. Um, so we've got, got good night, night jar numbers. There's great crested newts, ring plover are, are, are breeding. Um, and the long term options are being explored for this site um, and its future management, because I'm afraid it won't be quite so straightforward as just taking down the safety fencing and letting the public in. Um, but it does offer some some really nice opportunities um, for different things to happen. This is a view um, of Collerton Valley Common. Um, heathlands are open habitats, including bare ground, areas of grass, heather and gorse and several brooks rise on the heaths um, and create flushes and mires in the valley bottoms. And as I said, they all flow eastward towards the, towards the Otter Valley. Um, some of our commons have more scrub and woodland cover, and although that might not make them on paper the best heathland, it does, it does add biodiversity. So some, sometimes the, the best places for a, a real blend and rich wildlife is, is not the best heathland. Um, and we're quite proud of our, our sort of mixtures um, on, the, on the fringes. The pebble beds is broken down into about 70% heathland and scrub, about 15% bog, 5% water, so that's both standing water bodies and, and also running water, and 9% woodland, which is an equal split, um, sort of um, three of each um, between coniferous woodland, broadleaf and mixed woodland. Um, and this space is important for wildlife and for people. Um, this picture particularly, um, the Scots pine, and they've kind of been stunted by several, several wildfires in this area, kind of give it a suggestion of um, the grassland plains of Africa. So that's, that's my link to the next slide. So Africa has its, its big five species. Um, I'm going to introduce our top four. So top left, you can all shout out because you're muted, you know exactly what it is. <laughs> it's dark for warbler. It lives here all year round, making its home amongst the dense gorse. Um, so he finds his food amongst the gorse, about 90% of his food, um, spiders and other insects are in there. Um, and already, already this time of year, um, you can see them standing in the top of, um, of those dense gorse bushes and, and calling to, to maintain his territory. Um, so good, good, uh, good um, numbers already showing on the heaths. Then under, under him, we've got the nightjar, who rather sensibly, being that it's Blue Monday, um, is in sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, <laughs> but will make his mi migration um, north, arriving in the late spring. Nightjars nest on the ground, making them a bit susceptible to disturbance. Um, they particularly favour areas that have been recently cleared of trees. So we found in those, those areas that have reverted from forestry back to heathland or areas of 
um, dense woodland that have been cut and returned to heathland, um, that's, that's a really good sort of spot for them for a number of years. Um, and if you haven't heard their chirring call and seen their acrobatic displays on a summer evening, which I'm sure you all have, um, but if you haven't, make it your New Year's resolution to hear and see this iconic species. Um, it's a real feature of heathland in the summer. Above the night jar, we've got our southern damselfly, and I do apologise, these are massively out of scale. <laughs> so um, a southern damselfly is only kind of two, two joints of your finger long, they're, they're, they're very small, um, but a lovely illustration here. Um, they're less widespread across the heaths than, than the bird species, um, but some of the mires um, provide ideal habitat and careful protection through innovative management techniques, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then the final one is the silver studded blue butterfly. So this is not one of our designated species. So we don't have to, um, not, not attach to any of um, the designations, um, but one we still actively manage areas of the heath for. Um, so this is some, some, some work I've been doing very recently with my volunteers um, to keep um, areas of um, bare ground available. They have um, this incredible symbiotic relationship with the black ant. So the ants need bare ground and the butterflies um, and the caterpillars need suitable food source nearby. So there's sort of that match of habitats nearby that's really important. Other important species on heaths include obviously reptiles. Um, we have all of the UK species, but the sand lizard and invertebrates, particularly certain types of uh, insects, but, but numbers are probably under recorded. We, you know, we've, we've got good records, but, but lots, of, lots of things still being discovered. Um, I can't possibly hope to mention all the flora and fauna. So little plug here. If you would like to know which 600 plants um, make it on um, to the heaths, um, or which of the 66 of the total 148 birds breed here, or even how many wood lice make their home on the heaths. I can tell you that actually, that's five. <laughs> um, but anything else, um, you can download a, yeah, a copy of our um, biodiversity audit, which is available on our website. And um, obviously lots of information there about all the different things. So that's the wildlife. Um, let's think about, about the people as well. So this slide has got some sort of statistics there. And the background for this is that in 2018, we commissioned a, a study to understand um, and evaluate the heaths and the well-being value of, of, the, of the pebble beds as a place for recreation and exercise. This was to clarify how health and well-being values could be incorporated into public funding analyses, because the moment we get our money through countryside stewardship to effectively farm the heaths for wildlife, but as many of you will know, that funding stream will dry up in the near future. And we are looking at, um, at influencing um, policymakers so that, um, like other la farmers and land managers, we will be able to um, get payments for delivering pu public good for what society wants. So, so this was a, um, a way of gaining insight into, into that. Um, and to look at how um, partnerships involving private sector organisations um, can promote health and well-being outcomes from, from nature sites. So um, the, top, the top score, this sort of um, nearly half a million pounds worth of, of, of economic value was based on the amount that people were prepared to pay to visit the site. And that was through... Um, through studies, surveys done on how far people had traveled and how, how much they were prepared to pay um, and what, what value that was on, um, on the health service and, and all sorts of other things. So really interesting work um, and it will help us kind of lob lobby policymakers to take public, public value into, into account when, when planning future funding for the natural environment, so future um, environmental land management schemes. Uh, to influence strategic planning um, at county, at district council, and also at our own organisational levels and our partnerships across the heath. 
Um, and obviously it's got benefits to people for improving the coordination of existing activities um, so that we can consult stakeholders like disability groups on paths and access, and we can target activities to disadvantaged groups such as um, those who don't have transport or older people um, or, or people who perhaps wouldn't choose to come to the heaths. Um, and obviously that, that's, um, that's good news. Um, oh, sorry, I slipped towards, there we are. Um, Heathlands were created by people, so they are what we would refer to as a cultural landscape. Um, and this day they're, they are shaped by human activity. I'm not going to dwell very long in this presentation on, on the Marines, but, um, but they are there. And they use Woodbury training area each week as part of the basic commando training and also their officer training. Um, and they are great conservation partners. Um, they, they do a lot of a lot of benefit, um, although they, they they you know they are um, a feature that you perhaps wouldn't expect on a, on a, on a site like ours. So going back um, to sort of the, the history of people on the heaths, five thousand years ago, early man first used the clearings in what would have been a really heavily forested landscape to hunt for large animals. We know this um, because nap flint arrowheads uh, and tools have been found. Um, we've got Woodbury Castle, um, an Iron Age hill fort. Uh, and there's an artist impression of what the interior might have looked like, this evidence of, of these round houses and also some square buildings um, on, 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 on tall legs, which would have been a granary to keep um, to keep grain out of the reach of vermin. And this is my only slide that's not from the heaths. Um, this is a, a picture of children collecting firewood and, and furs, so, so not from the heaths, but, but obviously typical of, of the kind of activities that the commoners would have needed to do or would have taken part in. They would have needed the heaths to provide fuel to burn, um, heather for animal bedding, building materials, stone, sand and clay, and they would have foraged for food or trapped animals. And of course, um, they would have had used the space to graze, to graze their animals. There are no commoners um, left on the heaths uh, any longer. There were, I think there's, there's only one on Colleton Rally who, who doesn't exercise their right to graze a certain number of beasts. Um, but obviously, um, we're replicating replicating the, the um, actions of the commoners um, in keeping it clear of vegetation um, because it, it is a really important habitat for, for that wildlife. So for those of you who haven't um, studied geography recently, um, without the commoners using the heaths, um, heathland succession would occur. So if you're not a, um, a biologist or an environmental scientist, this picture illustrates the process really, really clearly. Over time, open heath will revert to scrub and from scrub to woodland, and then the heathland would be lost. So although, as I mentioned earlier, woodland has biodiversity value, um, the heathland would be lost and the Pebble Bed Heath Conservation Trust and the other heathland managers are replicating the commoners of old in order to maintain this cultural landscape, because now we know um, we value these places and recognise um, the unique suite of species that couldn't exist anywhere else. So I don't want you to get in your head that I, you know, that heathland is better than any other habitat, but because of its rarity and because it supports these particularly rare species, it is worth um, managing it, um, and that 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 is what we do. We we replicate the commoners. Um, uh, and keep it open um, for those for those species. So we do this by cutting down trees. Doesn't make us very popular. People call us the Pebble Bed Heath Devastation Trust um, because our team are are fairly mechanised. We've got a, a team of two full time rangers uh, and one part time contractor, and in the winter the heaths change uh, and we and we clear large areas. We remove the scrub and we take um, 
the top layer of vegetation off by scraping it um, to keep the, so that march of woodland in check. Um, middle inset picture is, is fire. Um, fire is a really useful tool in controlled situations. We can swale um, legally between October and February, but in reality, it's really only a handful of days that are suitable and in some years none and it's around about this sort of time of year sort of end of end of um january early february um when um when it's cold and 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 dry and and the conditions are just right so some years there, there are no opportunities for that only half a hectare at a time is is burned and in a very controlled way so the picture is is sort of demonstrating this is a what we call a back burn. So you can see the direction of the wind um, and the direction of the fire is in the opposite direction. So it's very controlled. And if the wind gets up, there is no material because that's already been burnt. So it's, it's, it's a very safe way of doing it. There's a double fire break. And our team are so proficient at this that they can do it safely with only the two of them. And they can actually get it to, to meet um, at the edge of the and, and almost extinguished itself because there's no material. Um, but we do take it, it very seriously. And obviously it, it means that we can take that heathland um, back down to zero. So it's a bare ground, which is, which is really useful. It sort of takes the, the heathland clock back to, sets it back to zero. Um, and it obviously removes the material so that we don't get a layer of, um, a vegetation kind of breaking down and enriching the soil, which is not what you want um, when you want poor, impoverished soil. Um, and then ponies um, and cattle are also used to manage the vegetation naturally. So all of the heathland manager across the heath, or all four um, managers of heath use ponies and cattle in a different way. The benefit of, of that is that ponies and cattle collectively um, eat the vegetation in a different way. So by using a mixture of, of them um, can really benefit the, and open up the habitat. So the way I describe it, so apolo I apologize, this is how I describe it to the children when I'm working with school groups. The, um, the cattle kind of just march in there and eat everything and then sit down and, uh, you know, and, and chew, chew the cud and get, and get on with it. The ponies, like this one pictured here, are a little bit more select and they'll choose the sort of choices greenest bits um, which means that they'll kind of wander around in in amongst the gorse um, and open it up a little bit and open up the habitat um, with 24 kilometers of fire breaks to mow um, if the ponies can help out that also reduces our consumption of, of diesel at the same time so um, as well as keeping out down the vegetation it also has has benefits to to, to the management time as well and, and our kind of our carbon footprint This is an aerial view of Bicton Common, uh, and it shows either the presence of aliens or possibly demonstrates how our ranger team are breaking up the age structure of the heath. So if you remember the species I introduced earlier, the Dartford warbler needing its dense stands of gorse, um, there's lots of that here on, on Bicton Common, although this photo was a, a few years ago, there's much more now. Um, but after many years, that, that mature gorse gets a bit leggy and, and starts to decline. Then we had the nightjar, and the nightjar needs to be able to nest on the ground and hunt night flying insects. Um, and when the gorse closes in, that becomes more difficult. We've got the southern damselfly, um, and they really are the pickiest of all. They need the water to be just the right temperature, the right pH, flowing at the right speed. So they're not even here, they're, they're a little bit further north. And then we've got the silver studded blue um, and the silver studded blue needs the food plants near the bare ground. So we've got just three species because we're not going to talk about the, the damselfly for a minute. We've got three species and they all need something different. And the heathland is always trying to turn itself back into woodland. So we need to create a mosaic ha of habitats. So this sort of really shows that. So in a, in a single block of one age, um, we've managed it by, by taking that, that, that material away, either by cutting or by grazing or by burning. So that's, that's the key, I suppose, having a mosaic of habitats to support a wide range of 
um, and I might be unpopular with the butterfly lovers on here, um, if I might say fairly, fairly, fairly demanding species that we've got, um, whilst keeping the vegetation in check. And that's really the key to, to heathland management success is manage your habitats uh, and make sure you've got a little bit of everything for everything you might want to have. So we have two, um, we have a very, as I said, a heavily mechanized approach, two full-time rangers, part-time contractor in winter, and we have the best machines. But we've also got practical volunteers um, who work alongside our rangers and um, individuals can deliver environmental benefits for wildlife and people. So they clear vegetation too, but they do it in a, in a smaller, a little bit more careful way. Um, and we're also really lucky we have monitoring volunteers, a, a, a team who look at all sorts of different species uh, and, and monitor and collect data for us. And archaeological archaeological volunteers who deepen our understanding of the site's ecology and, and, and heritage. And so both the monitoring team and the archaeological team feed into our wider management as well. So that's, that's kind of what Heathland is, why it's important. Um, this slide shows that from from date so i kind of want to put it into context with with where we are now so from data from people counters on the east Evan way um after after the first lockdown in 2020 visitor numbers on the heaths had increased by up to 60 percent based on pre-2020 2019 um, figures um thankfully numbers have sort of settled a little um, things have gone not back to normal, perhaps, but certainly back to more, more reasonable numbers. Um, but with a growing population, we know there will be an increased recreational demand. So for us, COVID has given us a sort of a vision into the future. So when Cranbrook is fully built and the east of the X developments are all, you know, are all there, when Exmouth gets more housing, when all of the villages uh, are meet, that are trying to meet their local plan. Um, when all of those houses are built, um, we know that the Heaths are, are going to face um, what we call visitor pressure. If one in two visitors comes with at least one dog, um, that causes perhaps some issues. So many of the smaller ponds, so the main, main picture on this slide sort of illustrates this, many of the smaller ponds on the core area of Heath um, support little biodiversity. So there are there are other places um, in the sort of south and the north that, that are better, but where the big dog walking pressures are, the water bodies are pretty poor. Um, litter and fly tipping draw time and arguably, um, you know, a, the least valuable aspect of, of looking after land. Um, and fire, which is the last one, the kind of the picture of the three trees. I've, I've mentioned fire in a, in, a, in a good way, but wildfire is, is not a good management tool. So the first photo here shows um, an area of single aged heath. So the photograph was taken, I mean, it's very beautiful. Um, uh, and but it but it shows that most of the heaths here is of the same age structure um, after a significant wildfire in 2010. The photographer went back in 2017 after a second wildfire, and so the second photo is one day, and the third photo one month after that second fire in 2017. So that you can see the green shoots of grass already showing but dangerous and unplanned and uncontrollable um, wildfires instantly destroys um, valuable heathland and years of careful management. So on Collison Rally Common, there is a lot of heathland that is, um, that dates back from, you know, it, from, from 2017. So it's what, um, five years, six years old and um, a lot that, a lot, a lot that it does it dates from that that wildfire in 2010 so is now um 12 years old 
Um, we don't want wildfire. Um, we guard against it. Um, but when we have it, we deal with the consequences. So that's when we would need to start thinking about breaking up the age structure so that we don't have huge, huge blocks, whole commons that are 12 years old, because that's not the, the best for, for the wildlife that we are trying to encourage. But compared to smaller urban heaths, we, we are really fortunate. Um, local people value this, even if they don't understand heathland, they value this space and they, that they, are, they are mindful to uh, look out for fire and to report fly tipping and, and that sort of thing. So I think compared to some of those small fragmented areas um, along the south coast, um, the East Devon Pebble Bed heaths are, are very, very fortunate. Um, that slide um, about the kind of um, health and well-being benefits um, mentioned that we have um, an estimated 400,000 or more visits a year by local people. Most people are coming with it from within 10 kilometres. It's popular for a variety of activities, so informal recreation events, um, as well as military use. So that's what um, this photo shows. Um, and obviously, um, lo lots of people come for um, cycling and, and, and for running and that kind of thing, as well as watching wildlife. So we have widespread access across the whole site. So compared to other heathland areas that only have maybe a single access point, people can come from all sorts of areas all around the heaths, all sorts of communities. Um, and there's widespread access for cars. Most people come um, by car. Um, and so some wildlife and heart habitats are sensitive to disturbance and, and it's important to try and encourage people to not only behave responsibly but also to target um, them in certain places. So we have issues of overnight parking, off-road motorbikes and, and other antisocial behaviours but like I said we're, we're lucky they're, they're, in, they're, they're low compared to other areas. Um, and um, the reason I've got this slide um, shows some of the things that we're planning to do in, in, in the future. So, as I said, we've got these access points across the Heath, 11 or so car parks and loads of informal options. By formalising those, those parking options, we can hopefully create um, a better experience for visitors. Um, because as anyone who visits the Heath, particularly Four Furs, I wouldn't go to Four Furs at the moment because um, it looks like the surface of the moon. We cannot do anything to that car park to, to keep it um, <laughs> in a good state because, of course, we can't tarmac it because it's a triple SI site. So, um, so the rain creates these huge puddles and, and um, the guy who was going to level it out for us, unfortunately, had COVID. So that, that was delayed. So I would, unless you um, have a four by four, or you don't value the bottom of your car, I would give four first a miss. But the good news is that this, um, this week, um, planning, planning was already agreed. Um, we we're about to appoint a contractor to improve our car parks. So this is, this is great news. Um, it was delayed um, by a number of global factors, which I won't go into, and a couple of uh, uh, other issues. Um, but, but the planning is, 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 is agreed um, and the contractor is, is ready to go. So across the heaths, um, there's no let net loss of spaces, um, but there is an opportunity for us to, to deliver the best for the site and a better experience for visitors. So I mentioned that the heaths are common land, so they have open access. That's a right. Um, the parking is, is not, um, but that is provided at cost um, by, by the estate, borne by the estate. So this opportunity to um, formalise things uh, and make sure that the car parks are safer, they're better organised, um, better surfaced, um, so we don't have this, this problem with, with big puddles and, and, and ruts, and with new interpretation, um, is all very, very uh, imminent. Um, car parking will be targeted on the main routes, and then the smaller informal options will, will also be formalised to stop encroachment, especially by four by fours. Um, we're finding that certainly during 
during the summer months and, and busy bank holiday weekends if you can drive there people will park um so so that's important for us not to to let that creep and, and let, let 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 vehicles um damage damage the uh, the verges and and um the habitat and the reason i've got this photograph particularly this is upham's car park um and this is one of the car parks where there will be um the military traffic and the operational traffic so that's that's um the kind of management works uh, will be rerouted out of the car park so so upham's car park is actually one that will um at the very end of the whole process of car park improvements it will be closed to um the public because um model air car, car park will be improved and it's 200 meters away or so 800 meters away so just just a few few meters up the road um and then this car park will take the, the majority of the military traffic and obviously it can be opened up for school groups and things like that. So at the moment, um, that, that is the option. So you'll see in the next few, few months, the first two car parks to be improved, the lar largest ones on the main routes um, are Joni's Cross car park um, on the main road opposite Ellsbury Common and Four Furs, which is obviously on the edge of Victon Common. So those two car parks will be improved um, and, and sort of formalized and then the others will follow. From that visitor survey work um, undertaken by Footprint Ecology, um, this is why people come to the heaths. So um, makes it really interesting, particularly when people moan and groan about certain visitor groups. Um, I go back to this and, I, and I, um, I look really carefully at that. So you can see if you're a horse rider, that's the pink section. Um, horse riders don't cause us too many problems um, and they're a fairly small um, portion of, of our overall visitors. Um, the reason people come is for dog walkers, um, but this is also the reason why people don't come. So families with young children, anyone less mobile will likely to be in the main car parks and not straying too far. And that same 800 meters um, is, is probably the same amount of space needed for a dog to do its business. And that's probably how far you're gonna walk with a small toddler. So um, there is more that we can do to, to, to improve this. So I hope you've all had your dinner and you don't, <laughs> that, that picture isn't too graphic, I think of that dog, but that this is probably the single one issue. If I could wave a magic wand, I would, I would try and, try and um, alleviate. Um, so we installed and paid for dog bins to be installed and emptied. And there's now new locations um, and support from E7 District Council to mitigate visitor pressure but particularly visitors with dogs. Um, this comes from the development le levy. So when, um, when houses are built, um, developers pay for money for the sensitive types, so at sensitive sites. So more people will mean more pressure on, on these sensitive sites. Um, we share mitigation wardens and a project officer for um, a project called Devon Loves Dogs. Um, and they're hosted by East Devon District Council, but we share those officers and their, their time with the ex estuary and with Dawlish Warren um, because they're the other two triple SI sites in, in the area, the most, the most important and, and threatened sites. We also ask all commercial dog walkers to become registered business users. Um, they're then licensed to operate commercially on the heaths. And um, there's this nominal charge, so it's low. Um, because we want them to be supportive uh, and we want them on board and we want all dog owners to realize that this is a special place not just for them to be able to walk their dog um, but by walking their dog and not picking up they're changing that they're changing the habitat of the heath they're actually threatening it uh, enriching that soil uh, and and damaging it for the future so all dog walkers um, must follow and promote our, our dog code. So that's what we push out to, to the commercial dog walkers. So we display these on site. Um, we also have similar codes of conduct for bikes and horse riders. Uh, and we're working on one at the moment for runners. Um, but all of these groups are probably less 
less impactful. Um, the Heath is incredibly resilient um, because of the pebbles. Um, it doesn't suffer too badly from erosion. Um, and it's incredible to have all of this space that, that people can make use of. Um, but the codes of conduct um, and our sort of mantra, love, love your dog, um, love the Heath or love to ride, love the Heath um, are going down well. And generally ensure people get on well uh, and then can enjoy the space while respecting the habitat and minimizing any impact on wildlife and other users so that's really backing up the countryside code messages of, of enjoy um, respect and protect um, and that's something that obviously i'm pushing out in in all of the work that i'm doing so if you love the heaths um, how can you find out a little bit more or get involved if you're not already um, do consider joining the Friends of the Common. Um, this is free and uh, offers the opportunity to shape the future of the Conservation Trust who manage the core area. And in normal times, we run a full programme of activities um, and events, volunteering activities through the year. Um, the easiest way um, to find out more is to contact us um, by visiting our, our website, which is um, pebbledheath.org. So if you go along to the website, there will be a pop up and you can just enter your details and you'll get emails through for free um, without having to do anything else. That, that'll just come through quarterly with a bit of information. Um, and there's our, yeah, that's our website address, um, which I, I can probably pop in the chat, um, although it's very easy to find. It's usually sort of one or two on, on the Google searches. The Pebblebed Heaths Conservation Trust also manage um, the otter estuary, um, where at the moment we're focusing on improving the ecological, recreational and landscape value of this site too, um, near Budley Salterton. Uh, this is a picture taken looking south, um, down towards the sea from, from White Bridge. Um, it's actually a number of years old because there's still trees on the old tip. Um, and we're now one year into a, a bowl project to restore the natural function of, of the estuary by reconnecting the river to its floodplain and securing a sustainable future in the face of climate change and sea level rise. Um, the project will deliver new habitat of higher ecological value, whilst environment, environmental issues like the tip um, are resolved, so that will be um, safeguarded, um, and other assets for humans um, are, are safeguarded for the future. So it's it's a it's a project that that manages both um, the wildlife um, and also and also benefits people. The Pebble Bed Heath Conservation Trust um, are leading this for the estates um, with the Environment Agency, who are the lead the sort of project lead. So they're they're leading the project, and it's their contractors, Kia, who are delivering it. The Lower Otter Restoration Project is also part of something called um, Project PACO, which is uh, a, a, a project with partners in France. So on the San Valley in France, there is an almost identical river um, or an estuary. Um, and that project has, has drawn down European money in order to deliver the projects on both sides of the channel. The Lower Otter Restoration Project is about securing the, the best future now um, with, with sea level rise and increased storming, storm events. And um, it's about, um, it's, sorry, I'm gonna, um, got a bit lost there. <laughs> um, so the, the estuary was um, reclaimed about 200 years ago. Um, and so the marshes are going to be, well, mar marshes were sort of reclaimed for, to, to turn them back into farmland. We were at war with, with France at the time, but contrary to local myth, the construction of the earthworks was completely competed by local labor, not, not prisms of war. Um, but the tide will break through at some point and, and turn the farmland back into estuary. Um, so the pictures at the bottom of this slide show the embankment so the second picture shows shows the embankment you can see it's only only made of earth 
So they will fail at some point um, and the farmland will turn back into estuary. In fact, they nearly failed in 2019, which is the middle photo. This is the repair that was done um, because the, 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 um, the tidal embankment where, where people walk the, the public, public footpath was in within one tide of actually washing away completely in a catastrophic breach. Um, the valley would have been flooded um, and none of the benefits of LORP would have been delivered. Um, so by delivering the lower to restoration project, this inevitable change can be planned, um, obviously funded through, through European funding, and it will be easier to deliver before the valley is inundated with salt water twice a day. There's been over 10 years of planning and consultation um, to ensure that the assets for people can also be safeguarded as well. So there is a road crossing the valley that will be raised out of the floodplain and Budley Salterton Cricket Club has moved to a new flood free site. Well, it hasn't quite moved yet, but they've certainly built the pitches so that they can um, be ready to play when the club moves. Uh, and that's great news um, for the, that, that club. They will have a sustainable future and be able to expand and develop um, without the risk of, of regular flooding, which is that, that first photo there, which is a, it is a regular occurrence and has happened fairly, fairly recently. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, an old landfill will be protected from erosion. New footpaths and viewing platforms will ensure that people can enjoy the recreational value of this popular site. Um, the value of improving connectivity and delivering habitats uh, will be monitored into the future. So we're hoping to attract um, more avocets. Um, th this is a picture on, on, on the, on the, on the um, otter, but obviously a, a very popular species, very, very um, notable species on the X. Um, we're hoping that with the right kind of habitat, we will enjoy some of the success that the X and the X uh, and other areas like, like that um, will bring. Um, so things like carbon, um, birds and fish, um, because wetlands are important fish nurseries, that last photo shows um, some volunteers being trained to, to monitor fish. Um, so marine fish species like to uh, make the most of, of the little wetland creeks um, spaced for them to grow and feed without big predators and, and the sort of huge range of tide um, if they were out at, out at sea. So. Um, Wetlands are also important for fish as well as birds, which we, we sometimes forget. Um, this is a more recent view, um, looking north. So look at, for those of you who know the site, looking north of um, South Farm Road. Um, so both the vegetation removal from the field boundaries and the digging of these new creeks will enable um, the marshes to drain effectively. So by moving, taking the vegetation out early um, means, means that the, the habitat has, has more chance of, 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 of working, of draining effectively, um, not trapping um, material that's, that's washed down and also gives the best habitat for, for those um, species that are going to be here. Um, so the marshes have been, so the, these creeks have been, um, dug so that the marshes can drain effectively and once it's breached which is less no just just over a year away um this intertidal habitat will be inundated with seawater twice a day and the intertidal habitats will continue to develop so over the winter waders and wildfire numbers are already promising people are sending me daily reports and lovely pictures of of things so we had glossy ibis um in the new creeks um, over the weekend and, and then over Christmas, there were flocks of white fronted geese enjoying the site. Um, but it's not just the rarities, obviously um, more habitat means um, we'll, you know, the crea creation of conditions to attract a wide range of species, um, not, just, not just the rarities, but the species that we'd expect to have here in larger numbers. So when it's tidal um, and the landscape um, and biodiversity will continue to develop. So it's, it's not finished yet and we'll enjoy watching it um, make further changes over, over several years. Lots of you will know this. I'm sure you've had talks um, about wetlands before. Wetlands are well placed to deliver multiple benefits to coastal communities. So they're able to lock up more carbon 
than tree planting. I've been doing some work on this for some education work, um, some education resources today. Um, incredible statistics, you know, wetlands are one of the best habitats for that across the world. Um, they offer storm protection without the need for concrete barriers. Um, obviously they're important when you've got uh, an urban population, um, but here, if we can have a soft engineering option, then that's great. And there are 70 other estuaries in the UK and France alone that would benefit from the lessons that are, are, are being learnt here on the Otter as part of, of, of Project PACE. So the Lower Opto website is um, the best place for up-to-date information. Um, and if you'd like to know a little bit more, um, the Devon Wildlife Trust are ho hosting a webinar um, with the name of that project, Promoting Adaption to Changing Coasts, so PACO, uh, Promoting Adaption to Changing Coasts um, on Thursday, February the 3rd. Um, and I think this is now available for people to book via, Brent by, via Eventbrite. So if you go to, to that and, and, and search for Promoting Adaptation to Changing Coasts, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, that's, that's available to book. Um, and you can find out more about that aspect of the project. So um, to sort of finish um, my talk, um, this is one of my favourite shots taken from the edge of, of Muttersmore, on, so above Sidmouth, um, and looking across the Otter Valley towards the Pebble Bed Heaths and the skyline. Um, we've got a National Nature Reserve with heathland habitats of international importance, offering nearly half a million pounds worth of health and wellbeing benefit to society. We've got two habitat restoration projects, so Black Hill Quarry and the Low Otter Restoration Project, delivering sustainable management and improved ecological health. Um, we've got enhanced enhancing our woodlands for wildlife. So we've got woodland cover um, moving to um, from clear felling to continuous cover. And the estate are also ensuring wildlife and ecosystems are strengthened rather than eroded through other business activities. So the Otter Valley isn't going to be rewilded. Um, it needs to be a productive one, but one where the decisions are balanced um, and this view of natural, capit natural capital is realized. So improving landscape connectivity, landscape scale, sorry, landscape scale, strategic wildlife enhancements, and Strengthening partnerships, collaborations with citizen scientists and wildlife interest groups are all part of that. The bit that's important to me is strengthening public engagement and understanding of the management of the countryside, and that will be key um, because we need to we need to show society support for the things that we're doing. We won't be successful unless we're delivering what people want. So that, that will be key for me to, to, to strengthen that, that public understanding. So that's just a summary of, of Clinton Devon Estate's priorities for supporting healthy habitats um, and thriving wildlife um, within those productive landscapes. And we hope that the work that we do here on the heaths, in the valley, um, and in these, these, these um, restoration projects um, will inspire other people across the country to do the same. Um, and that we will have played our part in leaving um, the world and its communities and natural resources in a better place for future generations. Thank you. Um, right. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just getting Kate. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Let's give Kate a good round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, that's a really wide-ranging talk. Lots to pack in. Lots of um, facts and interesting things that we're all worrying, worrying or thinking about anyway. And uh, your enthusiasm comes across. So thank you so much. Thank you. Are, are you happy to? answer a few questions yeah do you i've brought up the chat do you want me just to go down through them do Would you, you want to... if you're happy with that yeah absolutely just... yeah no problems i realize i i get a bit carried away and i i kind of <laughs> oh. got very enthusiastic but um 
No, it's lovely. So I'll... Um, someone's asked about um, the Marines paying for their use of the commons. Yes, they do. They pay. Um, they they pay um, to to use the heaths, um, and that money um, go, goes into the estate. That doesn't directly come to support our work on the heaths. But like I said, they're they're very good conservation partners. They do litter picks and all sorts of things. A lot of the time, picking up civilian rubbish. Um, and in the past, we've used their helicopter access in order to move um, move material around. So areas where they've perhaps um, suffered from erosion, particularly on the endurance course where the Marines obviously um, do their, their timed um, part of their training, that the, the mire system there that's a little bit impacted um, by that activity. Um, so there are plans to, to restore that. And the best way to do that would be for us to cut some material um, from one area of heat, bale it up, and then drop it in by helicopter and effectively roll it out. Um, so they they are very supportive in that. But yes, they do, they do pay to use the commons. Um, and generally, um, as well as um, helping us out with with conservation obviously their activity sometimes creates clear that clear bare ground um, keeps vegetation down particularly where they've they sort of been um, uh, based or camped or, or, or done exercises um, but they also I think are on a, sort of a bit like an unofficial police presence certainly some of us feel more confident that they're up there when we're out at night um, and, and they're generally yeah just just good to have around. Um, obviously, some people have different views about um, about the defence budget and whether it's well spent. Um, but certainly, for our heaths, they do they do a, they do a great job. And we are we are partners in, and they help us with our conservation work. Um, someone's asking the best area for birding, I would say any, <laughs> any, any heath it depend, depends, depends. Um, what you're looking for um, because obviously some some of the wooded areas offer interesting things as well so crossbills and, and other things in some of the coniferous woodland I mean there are some great great spots but what you kind of want is somewhere where there's a bit of a mix of habitats so um, East Budley although it's not the best heathland sort of textbook heathland it's got more woodland cover um, and so that's quite good obviously you know Bystock is a fantastic reserve um, Aylesbeer, which is managed by the RSPB, um, has has got good records and, and 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 good 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 birds. But anywhere on the heaths at the moment, you can see um, Dartford warblers. Um, and in the summer, nightjars are well spread as well. Um, so I think it's just taking time and, and finding finding sp space where where there isn't a lot of people. So just a few minutes walk away from the main car parks, and you're you're usually um, in excellent habitat um, and, and you've got a good chance of seeing whatever it is you might want to see. Um, Elaine asked, please could you tell me if the Riverside footpath from Otterton will be maintained after the project is completed or will the footpath be divi diverted inland? That's a really interesting question. Um, so the footpath from Otterton um, is outside the Lower Otter Restoration Project footprint. And obviously that path, so from Newton Popperford right down to um, the sea, is impacted by being so close to the river. So that it, it is always going to be at risk from erosion. The ideal situation would be to create a riparian corridor and move the right of way inland by 10 meters, which would secure that footpath for the future. But people tend to like to walk next to the river. They want to be within two meters of the river. They want to let their dog run in, run in and out of the river. And that cr creates erosion and problems um, for, for the footpath. So the simple question is, simple answer is, um, the footpath um, north of the aqueduct is outside the project area. Um, so it is out, so it's outside of the project area. It would continue to be maintained. So Devon County Council have responsibility for those footpaths um, there. And the estate would work in partnership as it always has done with, with the um, 
with the county team. So once it's, when it's washed away, the expectation would be that the footpath would move, even if that means we lose a bit of farmland and it, it, it will just continue like that. On the um, Lower Otter site itself, that's quite interesting. So the western footpath, so the bottom section of that is closed at the moment due to the works. And then um, the next section that goes up to East Budley is open but quite muddy. Um, the plan is for that, the, both of those sections to be improved um, for the long term because that will always be the fallback position. So if the embankment washes away and the footpath, um, so that would be Otterton footpath one, which goes from Budley Otterton car park up to Otterton. If that was to wash away, there would be a fallback position, the Western footpath, which I think is called, it's a bit of Budley Otterton footpath 12 and a bit of East Budley footpath uh, two or one, I can't remember exactly which one um, without looking at a map. Um, so that, that's the kind of default position that, that the will, that the access will be maintained for, for the long term. We don't know when, when those footpaths will go. They are only on an earth, earth embankment, so they are at risk. There are holes in them at the moment. Um, but the otter is, is really well served for, for other routes. Obviously, there's Park Lane, which is the old, the old road there as well. So um, that's a very long answer. Really, I've waffled on a bit, but hopefully that gives you some, some sort of security that um, the footpaths are a very important part of LORP. Um, but that section that you've mentioned is outside the project area. So like all of the footpaths on the estate, we would try to work with Devon County Council to ensure that public access um, ma is maintained. It's something that's very important to us um, to allow local people to, to access the, the countryside. Uh, we passed the Cory Lake. It was very brown. Um, actually, it does look, it looks quite brown from from the East Devon Way, but actually from the air, it looks it looks quite nice. It's becoming quite a nice habitat. It, it, it will take time. And I suppose like a lot of the um, water bodies on the on the on the heath, because of the sandy um, and uh, sand and silt, it, any disturbance creates a kind of yeah, a muddy, a muddy looking water and it, it, it needs time to, to, to settle. And obviously from when more vegetation comes in, that 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 should become some quite nice habitat. So that's an interesting one. I, I, I sort of alluded to that and said it's not as simple as just taking the fence down and letting people in because, of course, that will become the world's biggest dog pond. Um, and that is something we would really like not to happen. We would like to keep those habitats which are actually developing really nicely. We would actually like to try and keep public access or restrict public access so that they don't become just another place to to let your dog uh, swim because there are plenty of those it, it, it's a uh, yeah part of that kind of decision making process to the future of the quarry uh will the hide on the east side of the estuary replace uh, thanks david um the hide on the east side of the estuary was um was owned by um devon birds and it had reached the end of its serviceable life so it was this time last year it had had a sort of safety check and it needed quite a lot of work and they have decided to to remove it um, because it's now no longer in the best place I think perhaps you know over time the habitats change and the view changes and their feeling is um, to remove it for, for safety reasons I think it's been there a, a really long time um, predates one of my colleagues who's been at the estate for absolutely ages and um, so I think it's been there since the 80s or something um, I might be wrong but I think it's a, a very very long time um, so their plan is to once the once the habitats have established themselves on on the other side of, uh, uh, so in the valley uh, in the project area they might um, invest in um, a hide as they have done it uh, obviously they've supported um, the hides at, on the on the axe at Seaton Wetlands. Um, so it's it's gone for for now, but hopefully something will be sited in, in a more appropriate location um, in the future. Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a very quick, good question. Someone's asked about 
ponds in dog walking areas having less wildlife to do to do to spot on flea treatments that's certainly a, that is certainly an issue in small water bodies um the buildup of chemicals um but i don't know I haven't got an answer for that, but I would suspect it's a contributory factor, but I would think it's probably due to the, the sheer volume of, um, of dogs. We know that most people, um, what did I say, 400,000 visits plus a year, we know that at least half come with at least one dog and most people come with more than one dog. So the, the heaths suck up all of this pressure, um, but, but dogs, yeah, play, play, play their part. Um, I'm just going to have to read this question, Catherine, because it's quite long. <laughs> Bear with me. Oh, no, it was just a lovely comment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Rich has asked a question about the impact of dogs on breeding night jars. Actually, our night jar figures are, are fairly steady. So although um, obviously gra any ground nesting, nesting birds are um, susceptible to, um, to disturbance from, from dogs or, or foxes or anything that can run out into, into, their, into their territory, um, we don't have any strong evidence that suggests dogs have a negative impact on our night jars. Our night jars are doing pretty well. Um, and I think a lot has got to do with the fact that we tend to keep quite dense gorse on the edge of paths and dogs tend not to go running off. I mean, I've got a spaniel and she's certainly capable of it, but I've trained her to stay on the path. The bane of my life is those sort of ball flingy things where people chuck them in into the, the, that habitat. Um, and the thing about night jars is they will sit quite tight. You can be really, really close to them before they will fly up. So even if I would think a nosy spaniel nosed off the path, if it didn't actually come right to the to the nest, I think I think there's a, a chance that they wouldn't necessarily yeah, leave the nest. Um, so we don't have any any particular worries about that if we did then we would mitigate in a different way and we'd perhaps have dogs on leads in certain areas but we don't have the science that backs up that um, at the moment with the visitor numbers we have and the night jars doing well it's a it's a, a balance that that we're we're we're, we're happy with uh, and we can we, we we don't think it's having any negative impact so that's the end of the list um, i'm happy to answer anything um, that people have got on top of that or anything else people want more clarity on? Everyone's gone very quiet, Mary. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm here. You're hey, here. <laughs> can I ask, um, will the beavers be impacted by the, re the restoration of the restoration? Um, the beavers will be, um, beavers can tolerate saline so they can travel through saline water but they're not going to they're not going to favor the estuary they're going to make the most of the rest of the river um, the main river isn't again isn't natural beaver habitat what the beavers will want to do is get into the tributaries in fact they're already doing that and they're yeah. heading themselves up so they will be on the pebble bed heath very soon it won't be long they're, they're, they're not far away um, and they've already been scouting it out um, so what they what they want to do is they want an area where uh, so on the main river there's, there's deep water um, that's that's good for them but it's quite fast flowing and obviously after after the re after heavy rain it, it can be quite flashy um, so what they want to do is they want to find um, a quieter area where they can modify the environment they can build themselves some some little dams and create a lovely wetland habitat uh, and there are signs on the tributaries of the otter where they're doing that really nicely um, and again those little wetland habitats are are just really fantastic for wildlife so then the, the amount of birds um, and, and, and other things coming in um, is incredible I mean uh, we have um, an operational um, yard a forest yard which is on the Budley Brook flowing up so the stream that flows from Bicton Common down to the down to the otter um, and the beavers are there 
and they've created wetland below between the, the yard and the, and the farm and next to, next to that. Um, and so seeing damselflies, dragonflies flying around in the summer is quite normal. And that's, that's really recent. So it's incredible how quickly they can change something, but they won't be advantage they would have an advantage from 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 the lower otter restoration project they will they will have to make themselves some somewhere else um, but there's plenty there's plenty of space on the river there's no 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 um uh no no pressure at the moment because uh what what they also think is because they all almost all of them are descended from the same um family the same same original pair of beavers that they're not um, not suffering the same stresses when they move through the territories. So if you imagine a river, it's very linear and they've got to cross a territory to get to a new bit or a new tributary. Um, they don't seem to be finding that, they don't seem to be uh, finding that stressful or, or causing problems. And the wildlife trust experts on Beavis and, and other people think it's to do with um, the fact that they're all related and that it's not so difficult because obviously beavers are fiercely territorial um, but because it's a cousin or you know an aunt or something that they're, they're able to pass through these territories <laughs> without the same pressure which is obviously good um, that, that's good news. really interesting I didn't know that um, just a couple of new questions have cropped up actually there's yeah. one that um, Andrew and Kate asked earlier about trail hunting on the on the commons is that allowed I know there's a bit of controversy at the minute or it's interesting one isn't it and obviously since the national trust have banned it on their land um it's a difficult one and i can answer i can answer honestly and say that the conservation trust team are keen for it not to happen on the estates that they are no longer allowed to meet they used to traditionally meet on the commons on boxing day um but it is a it is a really difficult one and obviously with the estate um having having wide countryside interests there are those conflicts but no the um the conservation trust do not do not support hunting on on the pebble bed heaths um and then i looked at the last question yeah. there, there's one from joseph about carbon dioxide and the burning of oh okay let me just scroll down That's just a, a, a second from last yeah brilliant so Yes, I, I can answer this question. I'll answer this quite broadly. So, um, yeah, Joseph asked the question about um, carbon dioxide release. So what I'll talk about is, is our, um, so we have, uh, the estate has a, um, a key um, objective to become net zero, and we are looking at every operation across the estate. On the Heath, we are looking at some of the way some of our operations and how we can reduce that so there are so burning material is effective heathland management in that it takes away that product from the heath so like in your garden that layer of um, compost or, 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 or leaf mold that's beneficial for your soil we don't want so removing it is what we need to do so that can either be scraping it and taking it away um, but burning it is, a, is obviously a much more effective effective tool. Um, so we've done some we've done some research uh, into removing the material and stacking it. Um, so literally stacking up every every little bit of um, chipping um, and removing it that way. Um, and it's 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 actually putting more pressure on the site. So obviously the more um vehicle movements you have to 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 remove the material that creates different problems um but we are looking at that and obviously you, do, you know to cut um to cut woodland to cut biomass um can can produce you know firewood and other useful products um but but fire yeah i think fire will always be um in in the toolbox um as a, as a as an effective as as effective tool um because it is in compared to the amount that's locked up um i think it would probably negate that um but we are looking we are looking carefully at that and how how our you know diesel consumption matches up against our yeah firewood and all of those sorts of things so um, i'm afraid I, kim would know more than i do on on that one but it's yeah certainly something i know we are looking at 
Um, on which common is the best chance of seeing smooth snakes? It is a sensitive question. Um, we wouldn't necessarily tell people where to go, but I can probably answer quite confidently, knowing that it's really flipping hard to see them. <laughs> 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 there might be one or two people who would who who would in, in, on the on the on the call today who who know where they are um, and have seen them. I haven't ever seen a smooth snake, um, but the smooth snake reintroduction was on Withercombe rally common which is obviously uh, managed by the rspb opposite by stock owned by um the district council um and but across the heaths um you know that you've got a much much more chance of seeing an adder um i would say yeah definitely much more chance but but a smooth snake they're very very elusive there's only a a, a fairly small population um but I don't know, maybe Rod, 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 Liz, Sarah probably will be able to say whether they've seen them um, in that area. I don't know if they've crossed the road to buy stock. You've, have you ever seen one, Sarah? No. Well, that's, that shows that you can spend loads Sadly of time not. on the heath, <laughs> but you can still, they can still be fairly elusive. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, it's, it's good to have them and, and uh, hopefully in the future, maybe some more reintroductions as part of uh, ongoing work with um, with ARC um, to do with that. OK, thank you so much, um, Kate, for answering all those interesting questions with very interesting answers and very informative talk and Thank you, and I hope we haven't exhausted you. <laughs> We've really had a good, good discussion, good meeting, and um, thank you very much. It's lovely to see, to meet someone who represents what's happening on the Pebble Bed Heath.